Thank you for joining us, Friendship Christian Church, Friendship Ministries YouTube channel. Today our message is entitled, The Way. It comes out of Luke chapter 9, verses 51 through 55. After our message, we'll close with a word of prayer, and then we'll go into a time of communion, at which time we'll take part in the Lord's Supper, we'll partake of the bread and the cup. I encourage you to stay for that. And all you need is something to eat or drink. Don't worry about the exact elements. Just something to eat or drink. Let us now go to the Lord in prayer. Fathers, you search our hearts and minds. We just pray that you meet all those needs that are listed there. And Father, we pray for our prayer list. That you give peace, comfort, and healing to where it's needed. And Father, we pray for those that are still trapped in Afghanistan those that are still being shelled in Ukraine, those that are first responders, those that are health care workers, those that are in the mission field, and those serving this nation, that you put a hedge of protection around them all, keep them free from harm, from evil and disease. And Father, we pray for Friendship Christian Church. We just pray that you allow it to shine with the light of the truth of Jesus Christ in this community. Father, we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Every journey is really a quest. Uh, it doesn't matter if you're Don Quixote chasing windmills looking for his maiden. It doesn't matter if you're Dorothy looking for Kansas. Every journey Every journey is a quest, a quest to reach a certain end. And uh, our lives, from birth to death, is a journey, is a journey. Uh, and sometimes we have an end result we, we need to reach. And when we die, that's the end of our quest. What do we do? What is the quest during our journey? It's to be better than we were the step before, taking a step at a time, with each progressive step, being a better person, being a better Christian. And the quest is not easy. The quest is not easy. We're on this quest to be better, one step at a time. And, and that quest is not easy easy. Uh, every time we set out for a journey and on our quest, there's going to be trials and tribulations. And it can be in the form of war. It can be in the form of a windmill. It can be in the form of a knight. Or like in Dorothy's case, flying monkeys and a witch. But it's a challenge. And on our journey, on our quest, we must get past those challenges. And once we do, we'll be transformed. We'll be better than we were the steps before. We're not going to be the same people because our quest is to be more Christ-like. We're not going to be the same people. We're going to be transformed on our journey. And that's where this text takes place. This text, Luke chapter 9, verses 51, actually starts out what, what scholars call Luke's travel narrative. And it's the story of Jesus' journey from Galilee to Jerusalem. He's moving from the north to the south. It's a journey from the life that Jesus knew in Galilee to the death that he will experience in Jerusalem. And it's a story in which Jesus' followers will be transformed as well. Uh, they've been eyewitness bystanders. They've been watching what Jesus was doing. They've been hearing what Jesus was saying. And now they're going to be transformed to lifelong disciples. On the journey to Jerusalem, they end up being 
much more than eyewitnesses. They're actually going to be active in the ministry for Christ. So as we explore this mystery of transformation in the very heart of the Christian faith, that is what we're called to do. How are we called? How does that call get to us? How does it get received? It's all part of the journey. It's all part of the quest. And we will receive it. And our, our quest is to become and do that which we are called upon to do. So Luke uh, refers to the threatened Christians because uh, uh, when he writes this, Christianity is under persecution. They're threatened. And in Acts chapter 9, verse 2, Luke describes these Christians who are under persecution, who are being threatened, as followers of the way. The followers of the way. Early Christians used to refer themselves as we're walking the way. We're following the way. Our assembly is the way. And it seems that by calling themselves the way, the early church was really describing something very important about who they were. They're not bystanders. To be the way, to be on the way, to be in the way, to be the way, means you're on a journey. You're moving. You're not just standing still. They're not static, settled community. They didn't refer to themselves as the immovable fortress of faith or the mighty temple of absolute truth. Rather, they refer to themselves as the way. And that is the name for the group of people who see themselves as a true identity on a journey. They're Christians on a journey. Their true identity is Christians on the move, on the journey, on a quest, on a quest. And they discover, they discover, they discover, they discover the deepest sense of truth and faith as they're on the move. Well, they are followers of Jesus Christ. So that means Jesus is at the head. He's at the lead. And they're on a quest. They're on a journey. And they're following his lead. Well, to follow means you're moving. And they're moving forward behind Jesus. That makes it the way. And we must ask ourselves, are we moving forward with Jesus? Are we on our quest to be Christ-like? Are we following Jesus, or are we just standing still? It's important to know that for your Christianity. We're to be followers. Uh, and the way, his way, his way, was to give self giving love. He gave of himself and his love all along the way. And our journey, like all journeys, will mean that we're going to face trials and tribulations. There's going to be risks, and there's going to be times of conflict. And there's also a promise, though. The promise that on the journey, we will be transformed. We will be achieving more Christ-likeness. We're going to be a different person as we take these steps forward following Jesus. So the promise uh, that in losing our lives, we will be saved. We will be saved. We're putting to death our old life. And we're going to be saved in a new life. That's baptism. So the promise that on the way we'll find a new and abundant life. 
And I want to take you to verse 51. As the time approached for him to be taken up to heaven, Jesus resolutely set out for Jerusalem. Resolutely, he was not going to not get to Jerusalem. And he sent messengers on ahead who went into a Sumerian village to get things ready for him. Now, the first episode of this journey occurs in Samaria. Now, Jesus and his disciples were traveling through Samaria to get to the Jerusalem. Now, Jesus' route didn't have to go all the way through Samaria. <coughs> Excuse me. He could have went around. He chose to go through Samaria. It was the shortest route. And it's interesting, it's an interesting detail that he chose this route because Jews and Samaritans did not like each other one bit. Like so many uh, Middle Eastern neighbors, then and now, they had a centuries-long conflict going on. One of the flashpoints had been the destruction of the Samarian temple. The Jews destroyed the Samarian temple around 128 B.C. John uh, Hyrcanus uh, was the Jewish leader that led the, uh, the destruction. And he saw it as an unholy rival to the temple in Jerusalem. So a good way to get a group to hate you is to destroy their place of worship. And in fact, the dislike between Jews and Samaritans was so bad that in Jesus' day, Jews avoided Samaria. They would take the long route around Samaria because it was unsafe for Jews to travel through it. Then as now, there are some places in the world where you should not go. But this is Jesus, and he's going to go right through Samaria. So what happens? Verse 53. But the people there did not welcome him because he was heading for Jerusalem. When the disciples James and John saw this, they asked, Lord, do you want us to call fire down from heaven to destroy them? Jesus does not take a detour. He sets his face towards Jerusalem and he travels south straight through Samaria. And not surprisingly, because he's on his way to the temple in Jerusalem, the site of the hated temple by the Sumerians, Jesus is not welcome. At this point, his disciples, James and John, became enraged. They were traveling along, and the Samaritans basically blew them off, and they completely lose their temper. True to their nickname, James and John are known as the Sons of Thunder. The Sons of Thunder. So true to their name, uh, they want to make some noise. They want to make some noise. They completely lose their temper, and they turn to Jesus. You can just imagine their veins bulging and their hearts pounding, and they say, Lord, do you want us to call fire down from heaven to destroy them? Evidently, Jesus has given his apostles some abilities, but they couldn't use their abilities without Jesus' permission. So the sons of thunder had the ability to call down fire from heaven, but only by permission of Jesus. So they asked for this permission. Now, this is, you might say, some serious uh, first century Middle Eastern road rage. A village does not welcome them on their way, and the disciples want to call down fire from heaven. And what does Jesus say? Does he give them permission? Verse 55, but Jesus turned and rebuked them. Now, think Think how different the meaning of Christian life would be if Jesus had said yes. He rebuked them. That's a resounding no uh, because of a request for vengeance. Sometimes 
uh, you wonder, where, where did Jesus find these guys? And they've seen and experienced so much, and they still seek vengeance. They still have anger. They're not doing this self-giving love that Jesus has been preaching and teaching and showing. Uh, so they honestly asked Jesus for permission. They asked the Prince of Peace to call down fire from heaven. And, of course, Jesus says no. He rebukes them. Now, rebuke is a very strong word. In the Greek text, the verb is to rebuke, and that's what Jesus does when he encounters demons. He rebukes the demons. It's very strong. And he's rebuking them, the sons of thunder. So they're in their quest or their request for vengeance, and uh, fire from heaven, uh, Jesus says something that he would say to a demon. And he rebukes them, a resounding no. No more vengeance. The way of discipleship, the way of being a follower of Christ, is not to be the way of hatred and revenge. Traveling with Jesus on the road to Jerusalem the disciples learn a deep truth about the Christian life. No more hate. No more retaliation. Jesus has taught his disciples to love their enemies, to do good to those who hate them, to pray for those who mistreat them. And yet we know there's a big difference, a big difference between understanding the teachings of Jesus, and actually living the truth of the teachings of Jesus. Traveling with Jesus on their journey to Jerusalem, the disciples learned the hard truth, the hard living truth of loving your enemy, just as Jesus been teaching for three years. Now, it's easy to say, but it's hard to do. It's hard to do then, and it's hard to do now. But we're called to follow, to be on a journey, to be on a quest, to follow a Lord who did not call down fire from heaven on his enemies, even though he could have. We're called to follow a teacher who told us to bless those who curse us, and to pray for those who spitefully use us. We're called to follow Christ on his way to Jerusalem, on his way to the cross, where he did not curse his enemies, but rather prayed, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. So the Christian life, to sum it up, is a journey. It's a journey in which we discover our deepest and truest lives. The truth of who we are called to be and how we are to live together in this world as a follower of Jesus. The earliest Christians called themselves the way on the road to Jerusalem following Jesus on his way to self-giving love. The first disciples learned what they must die to. They must die to the old ways of anger and hatred and rise to the new life of forgiveness and love. Now, this may not have seemed like a realistic way for the first century Jews traveling to Samaria to live, but that's the way Jesus is. He doesn't conform to the culture. It may not seem like a realistic way to live in our present day world either. But as followers of Jesus, we do not fit into the culture. So as Christians, we, meet, we need to be about our way. The quest to be Christ-like. To not just understand his teaching, but to live the truth of his teaching. And I hope that's where you are.
I hope that's exactly what you're doing. I hope that the next steps you take, you're going to be better than all the past steps you took. I hope you're there, and I'm going to pray that you're successful. But if you've fallen off the path, if you've given up on the quest, I pray you get back on, get back to following Jesus. And if you've never done it, this is the time. This is the time to start that journey. Start that quest. If you need help, call me. 502-220-1285. Thank you, and may we close with a word of prayer. Fathers, we go forth to our week. We just pray that we can follow the way the way of truth, the way of being Christ-like. Father, we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for sticking around. And we now will go into the Lord's Supper. We'll take the elements of the bread and the cup. Like I said, don't worry about which one you have. Just have something to eat or drink. God will take care of it. Now, Jesus went to the cross. And he gave up his body. His body was tortured. His body was nailed to wood, lifted up for all to see, and to die there, hanging on that wood by the nails. And what he did is he mysteriously, miraculously, only a way God could do, was take all of your sins and heap them onto his body. He felt every pain that every sin had caused. Sin is not free. There's a price. Jesus paid that price. He took on the sins onto himself. And being self-sacrificing love, he died for your sins. And so, before he did that, he took bread and broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body. That's what he was talking about. And so we have bread. And we're going to do just as he said. We're going to partake of his body. Let us pray. Father, we ask your blessings on this bread. The body of Jesus Christ the body of the innocent given for the guilty. And Father, we take, we pray that you take the element we present here, that you transconfigure it to be the substance it should be. Father, we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. And then Jesus did something else. After he died for your sins and put your sin to death, he put death to death. He, he bled his last blood. The wages of sin is death. He paid the wage. And then he put death to death. By his blood, he gives eternal life. By his blood, we live forever. We will shed this body. And we will go to heaven and receive a glorified body. And live with Jesus for all eternity because of the blood he shed on that cross. And he, he took that cup and he said, take, drink, this is my blood. This is the blood of the new covenant. He made a contract. He made a contract. He's going to die for your sins. He's going to give you eternal life. And he did that. And that's why we have this cup today. Let us pray. Father, we pray that you take the contents of this cup, that you transconfigure it to be the substance it should be. Father, we just pray that you bless this cup in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much. And may we all go in peace.